I'll get going, I guess. All right, good evening. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sue Tebow. Um, I grew up here in Berwick. Um, my family has been in Berwick for multiple generations. Um, I graduated from Noble High School in 1983, and then after I graduated from law school in Syracuse, I came back to Berwick uh, to practice law. Um, I have a general practice downtown focusing primarily on real estate law, uh, simple estate planning, probate, small business law, that type of stuff. Um, and I was fortunate in growing up in Berwick to have spent a considerable amount of time on my grandparents' farm on Cranberry Meadow Road. Um, having pretty much grown up in an old house, um, I was able to learn a lot and became very interested in uh, the history of the home and the people who lived and occupied in it. Um, I loved listening to my grandfather talk to us about the stories of family members that had lived there in the past, things they'd done, things they'd seen. Um, he used to tell us all about the different people that would stop in and visit and the generations that had come through. As a child, I enjoyed digging in the attic and looking in old closets to find toys and board games and things like that. And as I got older, um, I was attracted to the attic that had trunks of people who had lived at the farm or who had died and their belongings had been returned to the farm. And it provided me with a better understanding of those people, um, the interests that they had, the places that they traveled, the things that were important to them. Um, and I have asked hundreds of questions over the years to various family members um, about the things that had happened at the farm. Um, if you look around your own house, you'll notice that there are physical signs of the people that lived there before you, especially if you have an older home. Uh, one of the stories my grandfather told us is of his brother John, who had gotten a vehicle that was new to him in the 30s, and he was showing off to his father, who was standing in front of the big barn doors. And he raced into the dooryard, and lo and behold, he didn't have any brakes. So he, he hit the barn doors, and they came down. And the, the marks of where he hit them with the vehicle were still there when I was there as a kid. So if you look around, there's usually a story for every little thing that you notice. Um, we also made our own mark on the farm. Um, I can remember the time where my grandfather had poured a new concrete floor in one of the shed buildings. And he allowed us to put our handprints and our initials in there. So those are things that are important when you're doing them, but later on they become important to the people who find them and want to know who you were and what you did and maybe why you did that. Um, as an attorney, I have spent a considerable amount of time researching titles, uh, especially in this area. We've done hundreds and hundreds of title searches. I've learned a lot about family. I've learned a lot about people that grew up in town. Um, learned a lot about the history of the families and how they're interconnected, and many of them are very much interconnected. Um, by doing title searches, um, I've been exposed to a lot of that information that it's important to me because it has an interest to me, but usually when you do a title search, you're doing it as an attorney for a specific legal reason, and you're not getting into all the emotional part of it. You're strictly looking at legal issues, who owned it, when did they sell it? Were there any liens attached to it? And you're kind of looking at just those basic sources of information. But if you're interested in the history of something, you have to dig a little bit deeper than that. You have to ask more questions, and you have to expand your search beyond the registry of deeds. Before I begin discussing how to search and trace the history of your house, how many people here have done and traced the history of their own home? How long a period of time did you guys spend doing that? Was it weeks, months, years? Years. years? years. Over 50 years. Yeah, okay. All right. I had all the uh, deeds. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you had a lot of sources right there. Okay, and you guys searched yours too, you said? Back to the, in the registry. Yeah, okay. Um, and so that's pretty much where I would suggest that people start is with your deeds and in the registry of deeds. Um, that does provide a lot of information to you. It helps you create kind of a skeleton um, that you can add from there what to add to it. Um, I gave you a handout and in that handout um, there's some information about the types of questions that people are typically interested in uh, when they're trying to trace the history of their home. 
a lot of people want to know when was my house built. Okay. Unfortunately, the Registry of Deeds can't tell you the exact answer to that because it's interested in the land, but sometimes it does provide clues uh, to when a house was built. Um, you can also go to the town, obviously, and look at records regarding permits and things like that, photographs that tell you when a house first appears somewhere. Um, there's a lot of information that you can kind of get a clue, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Um, you want to know who owned or who occupied the home, and ownership and occupation aren't the same thing. Um, someone can own a home but never live in it, and other people can live in a home for their whole life and never own it. So you have to look at different resources to be able to help you fill in some of that information. Sometimes people want to know, when was my home renovated? I know it's really old. I just don't know how old. Uh, and you look at, you know, when things were added, when heating systems went in, when, you know, septic systems went in. You look at things like that to try to give you a clue. You mentioned when you talked earlier about the fireplaces. Yeah. You could tell when, how old something is by the fireplace. You can tell by the woodwork and the style. Those kinds of things give you a, an information about that. Or when electricity was added to buildings. Um, people also want to know, what else was my home? Was it ever anything other than a residence? Could have been a doctor's office. Could have been a store. Uh, you never know what something, you know, someone could have had a uh, stable or something. Um, so you want to know. You know, what, what happened at this house? What were the kind of things that happened? And you can get into that when you start learning about the people that lived there or who occupied it. So another popular question is, who died in my house? Um, and there are sources that you can find to ki kind of give you some general information of who might have passed away in your home. There are some general steps to follow when you try to trace the history of your house. Um, I always suggest people start with creating what we call a chain of title, um, which is in the registry of deeds, and you try to link all the deeds in succession as far back as you can go. But you're going to need more help than just the registry of deeds. You're going to need supporting documents to help fill in the blanks. Uh, and there's a multitude of resources that you can use to help fill that in. You also want to learn about the stories, things that might not be published, so oral history, talking to people, talking to family, talking to neighbors. Um, that kind of information kind of gives you a little bit more information about what happened in your neighborhood or, you know, who was, you know, who was in town that people always came to visit or who was paying attention to what was happening and kind of know some of the history of the different families. Um, another page I've given you in the handout material is about resources. Um, there are lots of resources that you can go to to use, and we'll talk more in depth about each of them as we go on. But I've kind of organized some of that for you so that you just have some ideas of maybe where you can look to get more supplemental information. Um, as I said, I think that it's important to start at the Registry of Deeds. Um, by creating this chain of title, you're creating this backbone that kind of gives you some basic information about ownership. Um, we are fortunate that we have a county, York County, that has one of the oldest records going way, way back into the 1600s. So if you're ambitious and you really want to do that, you can spend time at the registry and hopefully be able to link your deeds going all the way back. Um, now, for, as far as doing title work, you could hire an attorney. You could pay a title company to do that kind of thing for you. Um, if you're truly interested in this, I wouldn't recommend that. I'd recommend that you do it yourself. Um, you're going to find information that is not important from maybe a legal perspective, but it is from a historical perspective. Um, and so sometimes we uncover things and looking at documents that aren't important for someone doing a legal search, but are important to help fill in some missing information about who the family members were, what divorces happened, who passed away, those kinds of things. And it's important uh, in helping you better understand the people who lived in your house. Um, before you go to the Registry of Deeds, I would suggest that you start with your deed, the deed that you currently have. And that's going to be your starting point when you create your chain of title. Um, I've given you in the handout a sample chain. Um, the sample chain of title is kind of creating that skeleton where you fill in the blanks that provide information that you're then going to build from. So basically, when you start with your current deed, you're going to put in your name. Okay? You're going to start with who the current owner is. And then we usually, add, what's important is putting in the book and page. 
which is the reference information that the registry uses, the date the deed was signed, the date the deed was recorded, and who was the one signing that deed over to you. And then you keep going back and back in the chain of title and connecting all these various links to tell you a better story. Um, the Registry of Deeds in Alfred, like I said, does have significant records going way back into the past. Back in 1882, um, the Maine Historical Society agreed to publish a set of books, a volume of books, that go back to the mid-1600s. Um, remember, at that time, Maine was part of Massachusetts. Uh, we didn't have our own information here. A lot of that was kept in Massachusetts, and they agreed to republish all that information and keep that at the Registry of Deeds here in York. So York has most of the information about the early beginnings of the settlements in Maine. Um, and that is available for you to see at the registry, and I've also given you a link on your resources page um, that you can actually go online and flip through all those volumes. Um, I can warn you that it's difficult to read. Everything back then was done in cursive. Um, and so be patient because it's going to take you a while to peruse through that and figure it out. The language back then is also very flowery, um, very descriptive. So you're going to have to just try to work through it and figure out what the important parts of it are. Um, you are able to access most registry of deeds now online. I think Carroll County was the last one in our area to go online, and they did that a few years ago. Um, but unfortunately, not all documents are available online. In York County, you can see documents from 1965 to the present, but you can't see anything older than that at this time. They're going to keep adding to that as they are able to microfilm everything in. But right now, 1965 is the oldest documents you can actually see if you go online to the registry. So most people who want to do in-depth analysis of their home, you have to go to Alfred. And the um, Registry of Deeds is located in the county courthouse. Um, and how many of you have ever been in there? So most of you. OK, so you know what it's like. Okay, Lots and lots of columns and stacks of books. Um, and so if you're in the older part, you're going to be dealing with the, the cloth-bound books um, that are really dusty and heavy. Um, but that's, the, that's probably where you're going to be spending most of your time trying to figure this information out. Um, the Registry of Deeds has added in recent years indexes. So as far as the index, and we'll talk more about what that means, is um, when people record documents, the document is scanned into the Registry of Deeds, but the names of the people involved are also indexed. And so those indexes um, you can view online back to 1946 at this time. So you'll just be able to see the index, but you won't be able to see the documents that correspond to them. Um, in some parts of the country, um, and when we deal with people that are from out of state, they think that you just go to the registry and you pull one sheet of paper and it tells you everything you need to know. So anyone who's ever gone there understands it's not that easy here. And sometimes when we're dealing with out of state title companies, they don't understand why it takes so long. So um, there are other places in the country, especially more towards the west, where there is everything is indexed by the property. The people aren't so much important as the property is. Um, here, however, if you want to learn about the property, you have to know about the people. So you have to do the research of all the people who are mentioned. Um, there are um, some terms that you should also be familiar with. Common questions that I get from people is, what's a grantor? What's a grantee? So a grantor is the, usually the seller or the person who's conveying a legal interest to someone else. They're granting something to someone else. The grantee is the person receiving that. So they're the buyer, or they're the person who's getting some kind of right. Okay? Um, other terms that you I commonly get asked about, what's, what's the difference between a warranty deed and a quick claim deed? Is one better than the other? They both convey title. You end up transferring ownership either way. The issue is whether it comes with a warranty or not. Just like when you purchase something at the store, they ask you if you want to buy a warranty. Same idea with a deed. So a warranty deed, if you're the seller, you're saying, not only do I promise that while well, I've owned this property, nothing has happened to um, impact the title, but everyone before me, I'm warranting that they had good title too. A quick claim deed doesn't go that far. A quick claim deed just says, I can promise that while I've had the property, 
nothing's happened to it that would impact my ability to sell it to you. But I'm not promising about anybody that came before me. I'm just promising about myself. Okay? Both deeds convey title. They both transfer title over to someone else. One just comes with that extra warranty that the other one doesn't. All right? So sometimes people are confused by that and they think that somehow one doesn't give you title. They both do. Um, typically, when someone gets a quick claim deed, they give a quick claim deed. Okay, you don't want a warrant where people before you haven't made the same promise that you're making. All right, another common, a couple common phrases are what's the difference when you see in a deed where it says joint tenants or joint tenants with survivorship versus tenants in common. So when you see a deed that says joint tenants and there are at least two people named, that means that when one of those people passes away, the other person owns that property outright. They don't need a court, a probate court to step in and have help assist with transferring that over. Um, tenants in common, on the other hand, is that you own a fractional interest. So if there's two people and it says tenants in common, you each own a 50% interest in that property. If it's equal, your 50% can go to whoever you want to and their 50% can go to whoever they want it to. It's not automatic that it goes to each other. Okay, so sometimes when you're looking at deeds, you'll see those phrases, and that's what it, that's what it means. So you want to be careful that when you do this chain of title, that everyone who has an interest, you follow that interest to make sure it gets passed on. Okay, it's not automatic that it just goes to the other person named in the document. Um, <clears throat> so, like I said, I find it very useful when I'm doing a history on property to create this chain of title. It's a road map, and if you start off with that general basic information that you get from your deeds, and if you have copies of all your deeds, you can fill out most of that at home before you even have to go to the registry. Um, but it helps you do that. Like, for instance, um, in my deed uh, for our property, you know, we look at who is the grantor, who's the one selling it, who's the one getting it, what date was it conveyed, and then there's this magic clause that you hope every deed has, and that's called a meaning and intending clause. If you don't have one in a deed, plan on spending a lot more time trying to figure out what happened before. A meaning and intending clause, and I'll give you an example of our deed, is meaning and intending to convey a portion of the premises that were conveyed to the grantor by deed of, and in this case, our, our property was part of the town farm. Uh, so the prior deed owner was Frank Stillings at that time and he conveyed it to my grandfather. My grandfather conveyed a portion of it to us. So our meaning and intending clause shows who the prior owner was, who the prior owner got the property from, when that happened, and where in the registry that's recorded. Okay? And I uh, probably didn't go over this yet, but books and pages, I'm talking about books and pages. For those of you who have been in the registry, you understand that every book at the registry has a number on it. Okay? That is the book or volume number. Within that document are pages. So when you see a deed referred to as book 200, page 20, you're going to find that volume on the shelf. You're going to pull out volume 200, and you're going to flip to page 20. That should show you the document that you're looking for. Okay? Um, meaning and intending clauses are, are great because it saves you a lot of guesswork, and it saves you a lot of looking in indexes. It gives you the link. The problem with meaning and intending clauses is they're not always accurate and they're not always complete. People make um, errors with page numbers. It may, you flip to that page and it's not what you're looking for. Someone just could have transposed the numbers wrong um, or they might, it might be on the next page. So you have to sometimes verify that information to make sure that what they're telling you is accurate. Another thing that sometimes are missing from meaning and intending clauses is the names of all the sellers or the names of all the buyers. Has anyone ever seen the phrase et al, E-T-A-L? Okay, there's more people. That's what that means. There's more than one. And they're not telling you who those people are. They're just telling you that there's multiple people. So a lot of times, and that's because whoever's preparing the document doesn't want to write all the names out. So what you need to do is you need to go to that document it refers to, and you need to find those names because you want that on your chain of title so that your chain of title is complete. Um, if a document does not have a meaning and intending clause, you then have to go to the indexes and you have to search for that person's name to find out when did they get this property. 
So if you're the, if you're the person receiving it, the property, you're going to look in the grantee books. Okay? So you want to start in the grantee books. So in the case of my, if my deed did not have a meaning and intending clause, and I knew my grandfather was the one that conveyed it to me, I would have to look at the meaning and intending clauses from the time I got my deed going backwards until I found the property where he acquired title. And so I'd have to look at all of those documents to make sure. Um, all an index tells you is the person's name. They tell you the type of document it is. You'll see WY is warranty. You'll see QC is a quick claim. Sometimes you see other initials that are there, M for mortgage. Um, so you're going to have to look at those documents to figure out, is it the right deed? My grandfather had lots of deeds. So just saying, oh, I'm going to guess this is what it's going to be. If you happen to know who the prior owners were, then you can go right to that. You'll look in the grantee index, you'll look under his name, and you'll look at who he acquired property from. So the grantee index and the grantor index are alphabetized by whoever it is the subject matter is. So if it's grantee, his name would appear as the grantee, but it will tell me who the grantor was. Okay? So it's alphabetized by the grantee, but it does give you the last name of the grantor. It tells you the date, and it tells you the recording date, and it tells you the book and page. You would then take that information and go to that volume, go to that page, and hopefully it's the one you're looking for. You'll find that there are some people that own tons of property, constantly exchanging property. That means you've got a lot of looking to do, okay? Um, because unfortunately, even if you see towns, sometimes um, someone might own property that goes from like North Berwick to Berwick. And it might say Berwick, but it's also part of North Berwick, especially people that live over like on Beach Ridge or Diamond Hill, okay? So the registry might tell you it's Berwick, but it might be both, okay? So you've got, you can't rely upon what's in the index. You really need to look at the actual documents to make sure. Deeds also provide us with a lot of other information other than who the owner is. It will tell us who the spouse is in most cases. If that person's married, you're going to see where the spouse signs off. You don't see their name at the top of the deed, but you see their signature. And usually there's a sentence at the end that will say, so-and-so is the wife of, and they join in and release their, their marital rights or their homestead rights. That, that's telling you, it's giving you another clue. So we know that maybe husband owned the property, but we see wife's name now appearing on the document. That tells you the, who resided there. She might not have owned it, but she lived there. And so that's helpful if you're trying to track history. These also tell us sometimes about divorce or marriage or subsequent name changes. Um, sometimes you'll see a deed which will say, um, let's say Susan Tebow, FKA Susan Clement. That's my married name, formerly known as my maiden name. And so sometimes it'll link, because any of you who are tracking women down, sometimes there's not a link. It's hard to find that link as, okay, I know their married name, or I know their maiden name, but I, I don't know both. And so sometimes you're trying to find resources that kind of make that connection for you because it's not always obvious. Um, Deed sometimes can also tell us approximately when a building was added. So a lot of times you'll see when they describe the property, they'll say, all of my land located on Berwick Street, okay? However, if a subsequent deed says, all my land with the buildings and improvements thereon, we know that there's been a change. First, the deed said, all my land, and then it said, all my land with the buildings and improvements thereon. So something happened in between those two deeds that lets you know there was an improvement made. Most likely, it's a home. And so that kind of gives you a ballpark of maybe when a home was added. Um, there's a lot of instances where deeds don't tell us the whole story. There's things missing. Um, sometimes not all the information is there, or the link is not clearly made. We're having trouble making that link in our chain of title. If that happens, fortunately, Probate court is right upstairs from the Registry of Deeds. So a lot of times, if you can't find the answer in the, in the Registry of Deeds, just go upstairs, look for those names you're looking for, and hopefully there's the link, okay? That's assuming if probate has been open for people. Sometimes probate has not been open for people. In that case, we'll talk about the other kinds of resources to help you fill in those names and get that information. <clears throat> Um, and how many here have been to the probate court in Alfred? OK, 
Okay, so that too is online. However, it does not go all the way back either. You'll have to look. They have card indexes, just like the old card catalogs that libraries had, and those are alphabetical. They're broken down in certain increments of years. So if you look for certain the year that you're looking for, you look under the alphabetized cards, you can find out information for, about that person, and it points you to a file number. Sometimes the old ones are book and page, same thing. They're doing away with that. Um, they're trying to get everything on microfilm because they don't want people handling the old books. So a lot of that stuff you'll have to go to the counter, ask the person, can I look at this particular folder? And it will give you that person's estate folder, which provides you with information about their name. There's usually an inventory that tells you what they owned. And if it's a good inventory, it gives you book and page numbers. Okay, so those are ways to help fill in the gaps that you have. Um, a true title search, if I was doing a title search for a client, I would be looking at everything that I see under that, those people's names who have owned that property. I would be looking at every document. Um, and although that's not necessary for you who are tracing the title of your home because you're more concerned with the ownership part, sometimes that, those other documents give you good information. There might be a conditional use permit that shows you what happened or what was you, the property was used for. There might be an easement that says someone can cross over the property to get somewhere else. And sometimes they provide you with other information. There's affidavits that could be recorded that explain family history. Um, so a lot of times what happens is when you do a title search and it's really confusing, you try to clarify that for the next guy. Okay? So you have someone in the family record an affidavit that says that, hello, my name is, and I am a member of such and such family, and I can tell you all the history, and it's usually numbered in paragraphs, and it goes through and it tells you who these people were, who they were married to, when they died, where they died, and it kind of fills in those gaps for the next group of people that come along. And so those are great resources if you're trying to do information on your, for, for your own history um, that sometimes those people have already resolved all these issues uh, that you're stumbling with. So it's sometimes important to look at those other documents. So let's say that you've completed your chain of title, you've gone back as far as you want to. So all that chain of title tells us is who owned this property, who passed it on to the next person. It doesn't tell us about the people, and it doesn't tell us certainly about the building. We need to go to these supporting documents to help us fill in those blanks. Um, so remember, um, like I said, that the chain of title is about ownership. Um, sometimes um, you may want to do an occupant chart. Okay? An occupant chart is different than a chain of title. An occupant chart, you write down all the people you know of who lived in that house. You try to put their name. You try to put how they were connected or related to the owners. Were they the children, the parent, you know, the nephew? Who were they? And then you want to put down your source. Where would you get that information? Because in, if this takes you 50 years, you're not going to remember what you found 49 years ago where you got it. So you're going to want to write your source. Where did you get that information? Was it from a deed? Was it from probate court? Where did it come from? So that later on when you pick this project up again, you'll know, okay, I know I read this document. It told me about this person. And if I have more questions about them, I go back to that source. So the occupant chart is not about ownership. It's strictly about occupancy. Who was there? And they might have only been there for a little while. They may not have been there for a long period of time. Um, they could have been a tenant. So a lot of times the old um, farms had the primary residence, and sometimes they had the in-law apartment. And the in-law apartment wasn't always a family member. It could have been rented out to somebody else. So if you stumble across that information, you write that person's name down, you write down when you think they lived there, how they were connected to the owner, and where you got that information. And that gives you a more complete picture of, the, of your property. So if you look at the resources that I gave you, um, I tried to give you some of the more obvious ones. We've already talked about the Registry of Deeds, and we've talked about the probate court. Another important one are census records. Census records are done every 10 years, um, and they are found in a variety of sources. You can go to the Registry of Deeds. They have some. I think it goes from 1840 to 1880 in the registry. A lot of places have them available online. If you subscribe to Ancestry or any of those other online um, resources, they have them available, the links to get that information. And what do census records tell us? They tell us who occupied a home. 
they'll tell you the ages of those people. And if you compare from every 10 years, you can tell when people came, when people left, uh, who might have moved in. Um, and depending upon the questions that were asked in those years, it gives us other information. It might tell us what they did. Um, it might tell us, you know, like I said, how long a period of time they stayed, and it might tell us when they got married. So if you see Susan Clement all of a sudden 10 years later become Susan Tebow, then you know that, okay, there was an event that happened that changed their name, and it gives you that information. So now you go back to the registry, and you can kind of fill in some of the blanks. The library. Uh, library is a great source. Um, so most libraries have a local history section, which I think is right over there. Um, and so there may be things that are in the local library that talk about the history of your town, that talk about certain families, that talk about history of the state, or military. Um, a lot of publications in Maine are about uh, Civil War heroes, um, different things that happen that way, and you can maybe find names in those documents that connect you to other resources. Um, also newspapers. So if you have the ability to look at old newspapers, you want to look at obituaries, you want to look at wedding announcements, and you want to look, look up names of the people that are on your list, whether it's your occupant list or whether it's your um, owner list. There may be stories about them. So I remember when you used to look at the paper and an obituary was pretty long, okay? It was a story. Um, same thing with wedding announcements. They were stories. It told you what everyone wore. It told you who came from out of town. So that's very well documented. That gives you a lot of information maybe about some of these people that you're trying to find. Um, so looking at old um, records like that, it might tell you about a fire that happened or something that happened in your home or your neighborhood that you weren't aware of that happened. So dig through those old publications because they do have a lot of information that you might find useful. Um, Genealogical resources. So it's a big thing today for everyone to have their DNA tested to find out where you're from. Um, and so a lot of these resources help you fill in information about your own family and other people. Um, some of it you're able to see, some of it you're not. The older the information is, the more likely it is you're going to have access to it. Uh, it's not as protected. Um, it's more public. So you can look at birth records, death records, marriage records. It might find publications that, were, that those names appear in. It might talk about what ship they came, over, they came here on. Um, it might talk about all those different things that you can find out about them. Sometimes there are deeds available to look at, and sometimes there's court records that are put in there about things that happened. If there was a dispute with a neighbor, um, that might be in there. So those are great to look at to help you fill in the blanks if you're missing some of the genealogical information. Historical societies local, state, and federal. Um, they exist for you to be able to help piggyback off what they have. So a lot of times someone before you might have been doing all this research and it might be useful for you to have. So they're a great resource to be able to find out what they've collected in their collections, um, what information they might be able to provide you with links um, for other, other research that you're doing. Historical maps and surveys. So the Registry of Deeds does have um, survey plans in there. They are indexed. Um, you can find them. You can look at the town, and then you have to scan through to either find names or locations to figure out whether that map applies to you. Some of them, more recently, you can check online. Um, but the older ones, you're going to have to actually go to the registry, pull out the file. They're all in separate files, and you'll have to open up the maps to, to read them to see if they're... Um, applicable to your situation. There's also maps like this, um, which I find helpful. Um, this map is of Berwick, and it basically, it's from, I think it's 1870, uh, 1872, and it, all these little things that you see written are family names, okay? So <clears throat> if I look for my grandfather's farm, I can find it on Cranberry Meadow Road, and at the time it was owned by his grandfather. So it kind of gives me an idea of who was living there at that time, and it tells me who the neighbors were. So sometimes if you can't find the link to your property, if you read your neighbor's deed, it might give you a name. Okay, so a lot of times those of you that have old descriptions, it didn't tell you the exact courses to go. It didn't say go south, go north, go... It said go over to John Brown's house. 
okay, and then take a left. So it's kind of, so sometimes those deed descriptions give you information about other families, about abutters and neighbors, and maybe their documents are a little bit more thorough than yours, and it might give you more information. Also, you'll notice that the names on roads are different, okay? The road you live on today may not have had that same name 100 years ago, okay? It might have been known as something else. And these old maps give you that information. Um, and a lot of times, um, there were no names of roads given in your deed. It might say the road to Messenger's Bridge, okay? So, you know, whatever road that might have been, you've got a couple to choose from, um, that, th that kind of helps you fill in the blank as to, at that time, what roads existed. Okay, how many roads were there in Berwick at that time? If you look at Berwick from 2000 to 2020, there's a lot more roads, okay? So I'm sure those people felt the same way at that time, that more roads were coming. Um, and so you can figure out, um, you know, approximately from maybe the road description or the name description of people that, the, like I said, John, you know, John Brown's farm, well, you'll have to look around for John Brown on here and see if you can find his farm, and that might help you pinpoint where further to look. Um, the town office. Okay, town office has lots of information. Um, a lot of times it's helpful um, before you go to the registry to pull your tax card, okay, your assessor's card. That card um, will tell you the map and lot number of your property. So if you want to look at a tax book, you can see maybe how that property compares or um, to all the other properties around it. Realize that a tax map is not a survey, okay? So I always have people coming and say, the tax map shows the line goes like this, but I know it doesn't. I know there's a bend in it. Okay, that's okay. It's what's on your deed that's important, not what's on the tax map. But the tax map gives you a general idea, okay? Um, on that tax card, it sometimes lists prior owners, and it gives you the book and page. Um, again, you'll have to verify that that information is correct. Sometimes things are not put in properly. Um, or just are inadvertently the numbers are tr transposed, so you want to verify that, but sometimes your tax card tells you three or four owners ahead behind you, okay? So you can try to help you fill in the chain. Um, tax cards also tell you maybe about building permit history or conditional use permits or variances, things like that, that kind of give you a story as to what someone did and why they needed to involve the town in their decision-making process. Public and private cemeteries. Um, I spend a lot of my evenings walking in Evergreen Cemetery with my dog, and so all the names that I see at the Registry of Deeds or all the hundreds of titles I've done, I see them up there. So um, public and private cemeteries provide you with a lot of information about families. Uh, in the past, most families had a family lot. So the registry might only tell us about the husband and the wife, but if you go to the cemetery, you're going to see all the family members. Even the ones that might not have made it past childhood, you're going to see stones for them. Those stones also tell us a lot of information. It tells us if they were in the military. It tells us if they belong to certain societies. Okay, so a lot of them have certain insignia on the stone that tells you whether they belong to the Grange um, or the Lodge or any of those types of things. And that gives you clues about, okay, well now I can go to look at the Grange records or I can go to look at this particular society's records to find out what that person was and what they did. Um, so I look at cemeteries a lot when I'm trying to figure out the history of a family um, because it's, there's a lot there. And fortunately, a lot of cemeteries are now online. So all you need to go is to that cemetery, plug in that person's name. It'll either tell you where that stone is located or it will give you a picture of the stone. So a lot of times you can check up on a lot of cemeteries that aren't even near you uh, to get information about people. Um, photographs. Photographs are very important in figuring out, especially the history of the house itself. I brought in some that I had grabbed on my grandparents' farm, and so this is one of the older ones, and you probably can't see it, but it's a woman with a small child sitting on the front lawn of the farm, and you can see the structures and the chimneys that were there. Um, you can see um, the trees that are no longer there. Um, and it gives you some information about maybe what was happening, the farm equipment that you can see in the background. And then we've got it through the years. And so then when my grandparents owned it, um, it's got the white picket fence around the front yard. 
Um, it's got a giant birdhouse that's sitting there. So all these different things that have changed, you can tell when that happened or which generation it happened to. Um, and then the more recent one of the farm um, that gives you some ideas of updating that was done. So photographs tell you a story. They tell you about the building and the changes that might have happened to that building. It also, sometimes if there's people in it, it obviously tells you about the people that live there. Um, and also, not just the building, but the landscape. When was the rock wall put there? When was the old shed or chicken coop taken down? You know, it shows you activities that you might not have realized happened on your farm um, or on your home. Um, so it's important to look at that. There might have been a garden there that there's not a garden there anymore, or where the giant tree was, there was something else there a long time ago. Postcards. I love going to antique stores and looking at postcards. Kodak um, had a program, and I don't know what years this took place, but you could send in a photograph of your home, and you got a postcard, that, postcards that you could then send to family members and write notes to. So those old postcards are on, they're not just historic buildings, they're anybody's house. Uh, you didn't have to have a famous house to, to make a postcard. So sometimes those postcards give you a lot of information. They tell you what the neighborhood looked like, because sometimes you'll have a broad scape of, of the neighborhood, and it, it gives you a lot of information. Um, diaries, journals, calendars. Um, I have uh, dug through a lot of my family's journals. It tells about different events that happened. Um, I, I can tell you that um, my grandfather had an aunt who's she and her husband were visiting the farm and while they were playing baseball on the front lawn he passed away and so the diaries talk about that so he wasn't an occupant he was a visitor but he died there and so that kind of information you can gather by looking at those types of things it tells you a lot about what was happening what happened during the depression you know what was what was going on um, archaeological digs and I don't necessarily mean digging with a shovel in your yard, but digging around, looking around at your chimneys, looking around at the woodwork, um, going through your basements. Uh, a lot of times people use old newspapers to insulate with. So when you open up a wall, you might find a lot of newspapers. That tells you the time frame that that happened. And it might tell you stories about what was happening in that area at that time. So do some digging. Um, in our house, when we put in gardens, we'd find old bottles or we'd find you know, different things that had names of things. That, those are all clues. Those are all give you information about what might have happened and how they ended up there. Um, interviews. It's always helpful to talk to people that know. So you talk to prior owners, you talk to their family members, you talk to your neighbors, or you talk to local people that you know know the history. A lot of it was documented, I think, um, remember mainly Berwick? Um, they used to try to interview people and put in, they'd ask them questions about different things they remembered. So go look at those things. It tells you important information that you might not be able to find from any of these other resources that we've talked about. Um, museums or collections. A lot of places have information that they're protecting and preserving. They're protecting those postcards. Um, they're, they're saving things that they've gotten from different people, mementos or special occasions that happen. Go look at them. I mean, Summersworth has their library. Uh, the town office has a lot of stuff that people have donated that you can go see and look at. Talk to other people in the historical society. They may have, obviously, if you're here, the people that are here also have the same interests that you have. So talk to them. Find out what they've done. Um, military records. Military records are a great source of information on people. Finding out, um, it talks about, um, you know, where they served. Uh, if you go to the cemetery and walk around, you'll see how many soldiers from Berwick fought in the Civil War at all the various battles. And a lot of them tell you what battles they fought at or what battles they died at. Um, so a lot of that information you might not be able to find um, without giving a, getting a starting point like that. The National Archives. Um, or the National Park Service also has a lot of information, um, especially if your home is on the National Register. If your home has been registered with them, there's information about that. Um, there are uh, the New England Genealogical Society also is a great resource. They have, you can sign in as a guest and you have limited access to certain resources they have. If you subscribe to them, um, you get more access to stuff. 
They primarily concentrated in the Massachusetts area, but they have other resources that you can connect to other sites. It's, so just what I say is when you're in doubt, Google it. Okay? Google is a great resource. Um, I just had a title search that I was doing trying to find family members from the late 1800s, and I said, what the heck, I'll just Google their name, maybe something will pop up. And it did. There was a book that was published in New York about this person's family, and they warranted a clause in the, in the thing that told me where they lived and where they died. I didn't have that information. So it was great. So just Google someone's name and see what happens. Um, you know, you might have to give some better search parameters to try to narrow your search. But when in doubt, if you Google, you'll probably come up with at least something to look at. Um, I've also seen where people use Cindy's List. Cindy's List is a site that helps you link to other sites. Um, so if you put in what you're looking for, it gives you information on maybe what other sites will provide that information to you. So that's sometimes a good resource for everybody. Um, any questions about any of that kind of stuff that I've talked about? Mike, did you have one? Uh, I was curious on um, what information a girl who might find in South Brook town offices. So yes, so we were all part of the same piece of pie at one time. So you might find that information. Um, and so my advice is to go to those museums, talk to those people, because as the further back you go and you're looking for really old information, it may not be in the place you think it's going to be. It might be in another, it might be in another town. Just like I said, Maine was part of Massachusetts. Sometimes you have to look, go to Massachusetts to find out what happened here. I think now with such a certain, um, uh, people that are, want to learn about all this stuff. They want to know about history. They want to know about their family history. I think more and more of that is becoming shared, but I don't think it would hurt to go talk to people there and see what resources they have. There may be books they have that other people don't have. Um, I noticed um, I've got an old photograph in my office that's of um, Berwick in 1913, um, and a lot of people have never seen that before. And it was something my grandfather had that he gave to me, but it shows the um, turn of the century when you had Civil War veterans, you had the new automobiles coming, you had businesses. Um, and it shows all that information on there. And I assume that because I had it, that other people have probably seen it somewhere in their family history, but that's not true. So you have to, um, you have to go ask and talk to people and see. Um, some places, some his, uh, societies post things that they have. They'll say they have a collection or it's on exhibit. It's traveling around to different places. So it's worth it to make the call and talk to your local librarian or somebody to find out um, if that's something that connects the two. Um, does anyone else have questions? Um. I have seen the old clock map. Yes. That they, uh, my friend, uh, she was my neighbor, actually had one. Yep. And in their moving, somebody stole the rug. Oh, they did? Yeah. The map. yeah so a, a lot of times you'll find that um, when properties get handed down, sometimes the deeds, the history, the warranties that, about the stuff you have in your home are sometimes passed down, but eventually people don't know what that was about or are not interested or it gets wet or it gets moldy or something happens and people just toss it. Um, so unfortunately, those things happen and you would hope that somebody else has something like that that you can look at. Um, but those old um, artifacts have to be properly preserved or you do lose. I mean, I've got a lot of papers that people have given to me that are so old um, they're very brittle, and I don't dare touch them. Right. Um, but but you have to just be careful that you you, you know you take care of them. Like on the map, um, you have that. I got a map uh, <coughs> from up in Rochester mm -hmm. uh, at the hardware store that they used to have. Yep. Back in the 1800s, and it showed Route Nine, yep. which was the crossroad. Yep. And it showed the little. Uh, pieces that went down to our property mm -hmm. even was on it back then. It belonged to Samuel Tibbetts. Yep. This, I happened to get this. I went to a um, Christmas craft fair at UNH 
and wow. someone had maps, and I saw this one at Berwick, and I'm like, great. So a lot of these people go around, and they, they pick up maps from yard sales, or they pick up maps of places that are going out of business, or libraries, or whatever, that are getting rid of some of their old stuff, um, and then they, they frame them. Um, I've had a number of clients over the years that have given me things that they don't want anymore, or don't think anyone in their family would appreciate, but they know that's an, interest, uh, 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 an area of interest to me. So I, I get that stuff. Um, so you just have to make sure that you pass it on to someone else uh, that's going to take care of it and knows the significance of it. A lot of times I think th things get tossed because people don't know why it's important. Anything else? Hopefully I've given you a little bit of information that would allow you to complete some of the work you've already done on your family tree. But again, it's it's it's... The extent that you want to pursue depends upon your interest. You know, how interested are you in this? What do you want to know? What kind of information do you want to know? We talked about who died in my house. Um, there is a website, I've given you a link to that, that you pay them a fee and they do a background check to find out who might have died. Um, they, they look at maybe criminal events that took place there. You see all the TV shows where everyone goes around looking for ghosts or different things. Um, Maine currently does not require that a seller of property disclose that someone has died in a home. Other states do require that. So if someone has died in a home, when you fill out your, your um, listing sheet with a broker, you have to disclose whether you know that someone's passed away there. Whether it's, whether it's a violent act or not, you have to disclose that. Maine currently doesn't require that. So I'm not sure how helpful that website would be to people that live in our area because it's not really reported. You'd have to kind of go through the back door and look at vital records, look at the town annual report to find out who died in town um, and try to, try to attack it that way. But there's all kinds of sites out there that ask certain questions. You know, is there a ghost that's, you know, living in my house? So um, you just have to kind of, you know, some of them are free. Um, you can tell by some of them that they're probably not that well thought out. Um, but, you know, it's worth a shot looking at things. It might give you some interesting ideas of, of where else to look and stories about your property. Thank you. Thank you.